Hello, good evening, and welcome to this session as part of Slow Food UK's Terra Madra Fringe. Tonight we are we have a host. Uh, we're hosting a discussion under the title "What Do You Cook When COVID nineteen Shuts Your Restaurant?" And my name is Donald Reed. I'm the chair of Slow Food Scotland, um, and I'm delighted to be joined uh, this evening by three members of uh, Slow Food Scotland's Cooks Alliance. Uh, they um, uh, either either run or involved either in restaurants or in uh, social enterprises and uh, food education um, in Edinburgh and Glasgow. And what we're uh, obviously looking to do is just to try and have a bit of a reflection on this uh, six months past and uh, how it has affected the restaurant world, but also the world of, of, of chefs. Um, the the the. COVID has, I think, uh, uh, started asking a lot of interesting questions. Uh, very immediately for, for, for restaurateurs and chefs, it's asking questions of their business. How, how do they respond? How do they keep the business going? What, what I, new ideas do they have to uh, implement? Uh, how do they pivot? One of the, one of the buzzwords of the year. Um, how, do they make, how do they make things happen? But I think it also has asked questions uh, of identity. If you are a, a cook and suddenly you're not cooking, you know, what, what, how do you, you know, how do you enact that, that part of your identity? If you are in hospitality and you're not able to be hospitable, you know, how do you respond to that? How, how does that, how does that make you feel? And, and, and how do you find uh, you, you, you trying to respond to that, uh, that question? And I think, Another question or series of questions that are raised by the pandemic um, are questions of relationships, because when the, the, the uh, when, when things broke in March, um, suddenly there was a, there was this break uh, in, in, in the relationship of restaurants with their, uh, their customers for a, for a start, um, with their staff, um, with the, the, the the other restaurant community suddenly, you know, they, they were, all these questions were being asked of, um, all, all chefs were asking these same questions um, and they had to start asking each other and then, you know, maybe change some of the relationships there that existed between uh, uh, other other chefs and cooks and folk in the, in the hospitality world. Um, questions of, you know, of your relationships with suppliers, you know, the, the people, the people that brought the food to you, the people that were the link to, to, to where food was produced and farmed. Um, and there was obviously a, a break, a break in that relationship. So how were those all managed? So these are some of the questions that COVID asked, and these are some of the questions I hope that our panelists will be able to uh, respond, respond to. Um, I'm going to suggest that each of them takes a bit of time to introduce themselves and a bit of a context and background to their business and, and how they have met the challenge and met the, uh, met, met the different uh, difficulties that they have uh, encountered and responded to that and what they've observed as well you know what they've seen other people doing what they've what they've noticed about the, com the communities in which they exist. Um, I think COVID-19 has said to us all you, ca you can't take things for granted uh, and and uh it has it has maybe asked us to reorientate our um understandings of how we see our businesses how we see our communities uh how we see our relationships and 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 that has uh, manifested itself both in local initiatives that i'm aware of and 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 our, our our panelists tonight have been involved in some very interesting community uh initiatives but also um national questions and interestingly in Scotland over the summer um, while the legislative program that uh, the, the the Scottish government had been planning to implement uh, during the course of uh, 2020 had included uh, a, a, a bill called the Good Food Nation Bill which a lot of people were uh, had been very uh, in, engaged with and uh, that was put in the back burner um, but obviously questions of food at that, at, at that national level ha had not gone away and interestingly um, a bill has been proposed to the Scottish Parliament over the course of the summer. Um, it's called the Right to Food Bill um, and it takes a certain section that there, there was a right to food uh, questions of whether that should be um, enacted within Scottish law, enshrined if you like within in the law to, to, to allow um, it to be uh, more enforceable this right to food. 
that was part of the Good Food Nation Bill, but it's actually been separated out and, and is being suggested as a piece of legislation. So that puts a bit of the background in, 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 into some of the things that are happening, as I say, at different um, parts of, um, of Scotland, both locally and, 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 and even nationally. And of course, it also remains in the, in the larger picture of the UK with questions of Brexit um, and on all the challenges uh, that uh, people are considering in that uh, light. So let me um, uh, welcome um, our, 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 our cooks um, from, and, and ask them to, uh, as I say, join this conversation, respond to some of the questions. And I'm going to turn first uh, to Peter McKenna. Uh, Peter is the, the chef and co-owner of a restaurant called The Gannet. It's in the Finiston area um, of Glasgow. And uh, would be great to hear from you, Peter. Just um, how you've how you've responded to this this amazing challenge uh, that that was this unexpected challenge that was thrown up, and and, and what you've you know, some of the things you've you've learned from it. So I'll I'll hand over. Welcome, welcome, Peter. Good to good to see you. Thank you. Um, pleasure to be here. And pleasure to be speaking to you all. Um, yeah, I think we were the the first restaurant in Glasgow to close. We were watching what was happening in mainland Europe and in Ireland. Um, I'm watching that unfold quite keenly. Um, my family are over there and, you know, numerous friends over in mainland Europe. So it became uh, increasingly difficult for us to wholeheartedly welcome in guests to a restaurant and to, you know, ask of our staff or our team to come in on a daily basis when we didn't, we didn't know what it was we were going into. You know, we knew it was a pandemic and, you know, we, we, we sort of had an idea of what it was, but you know, none of us have went through this before. There's no rule book, you know, there's not no text you can read um, to give you guidance. So we, we kind of had to make it up as we went along. So we made the the call um, before we were told to lock down, to close the restaurant. Um, and we had to get all our team in and, and tell them of this decision, which was heartbreaking because we didn't know at that time whether we reopen again. We didn't know, you know, it was it was all thrown up in the air. I didn't know if I had a restaurant to come back to. So going from from that moment to, um, I, I phoned obviously Giovanna and Steve at numerous times to get support to talk about ideas. But I, I knew I had X amount of stock in my fridge and in my freezer, and I didn't want it to go to waste. And um, I I had done some work with the the Postal community in the past. So it seemed like a, a logical fit and a quite quick fit to reach out to them. And through some of my team as well, we reached out to the food bank in Drum Chapel. Um, our suppliers got on board. Um, one of our suppliers gave us a refrigerated van. Um, other suppliers give us um, whole pig. And, you know, we, we got loads and loads of goodwill. Um, and then we set up uh, when we had a system in place, we set up a, a GoFundMe sort of crowdfunder page, which enabled us to cook and to keep active for over two months and um, maybe 10 weeks, I think it was all in all. Um, and, and that was giving us focus, uh, it gave us a reason to get out of bed in the morning. You know, um, like I said before, I didn't know whether the restaurant would be reopening. So as a gesture and, you know, as a bit of goodwill, I, I, I thought it would be nice for us to do something for the community. Um, and if, if that was it, that was it. Um, but, you know, over the course of it, the government packages, you know, the, the easy access to, to loans with um, favorable um, terms. It meant, you know, through that process, we were able to go, okay, we will be opening up again. And um, the Gannet isn't finished here. Um, and then we had to put another cap on. We had to start thinking about um, what's the gannet look like post COVID, you know, or in the middle of COVID as we are at the moment. Um, what are we going to change? Obviously, with the, the government um, guidelines, you know, the social distancing, et cetera, et cetera. But it, it gave us a, a pause for thought into the restaurant and how we, we saw it and what we wanted to do in the future. Um, so we kind of used it to our advantage, I suppose. Um, and we, we decided to give um, a more refined offering. 
we we um, done extensive work um, changing the the dining room for the guests um, and and it breathed a whole lot of new life and energy into the team and we all got involved we all rolled up our sleeves so in that way it, it something good came out of it um, and reaching out and you know helping in the community and um, my team were all involved in that and um, quite a large number of them and we also had different chefs from the Glasgow area come in and and help out also so it, it was really really nice it was it was really good we we found it very good um social conscience um, in Glasgow um at the moment you know we we've been closed we we reopened at the start of August um and, and it's been busy, it's been good, and you know, social distancing's been kept up. And, um, but we have that worry, you know, we're no way um, clear of the woods yet. You know, I, I think our biggest challenge is, is ahead of us uh, in some regards, in some ways. And um, I'm sure Giovanna will say the same thing. But um, the community spirit, you know, that's one thing we'll always take from this. You know, I, I think the, the community in Glasgow, we weren't the only restaurant to to look after their community. You know, a, quite a, a remarkable number of them um, had that same idea and, you know, that same community conscience, so to speak. You know, that's been really good. Peter, I'm, I'm interested when you, when you talk about the community because, you know, in some ways you, where you are, you're in Finiston. It's a, it's a very, uh, let's call it, you know, trendy. It's it's the kind of hip area for for eating out and and uh, seen in 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 Glasgow um, at the moment. And you know, you're right at you're right at the heart of that. Though, so so you could, on the one hand, beforehand, have said, well, the community that exists is is that sort of the folk that are out and about, the people who are nice restaurants, um, you know, your own customers, you could call a community. And yet you've actually referred quite a lot to the to a wider community and, and maybe not, not people who would have necessarily been acquainted with your restaurant before. Um, you know, places like Postle you've mentioned and Drum Chapel. I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're a number of miles away. I mean, they're, these are, these are, 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 are what, what would be called deprived areas. Or, you know, other other areas are certainly not the kind of hip inner, inner city um uh uh you know downtown areas you know these these are uh these are spread around spread around the city and, and plenty of challenge uh, do you think actually your your own sense of community maybe changed a little bit over um over the course of the, of these months and, 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 the, and the things you got involved with well yeah look at our, our client base they're able to go to the shop, you know, they're, they're, they're able to um, look after themselves. And, um, you know, this obviously hit me and my family quite hard. And I, I thought, you know, I'm not the one that's going to be um, really exposed to this. You know, there's, there's a lot of other people that are in a worse position than us, you know, and, and that was the sense that I had. Um, and, my restaurant manager um, got behind me from that um, and then it, it grew arms and legs from there you know when you do get hit by you know this pandemic and you're looking at the news and people are running out and they're buying their toilet paper and you know all this sensationalism um, and you, you have to really think who, who is worse off here? You know, how, how can we, we, we make a difference? You know, what, what is it we can do? You know, Postle is very close to my house. It's, you know, it's a 15 minute walk away. And, um, you know, so it, it is on my doorstep. You know, I live in Mary Hill. You know, it's, it's, it's all there. It's, it's, it's quite close. Um, and, and these are the people that would really struggle. You know, I, I made a point of going down to the food banks um, and over on the East End as well, you know, to see, to see what was happening there and to see how, how it is we could help. Um, but um, the, the community spirit, when I speak about community spirit, it's about people pitching in, you know, it's about people helping out and look at those who are vulnerable in the community. And um, we started a, 
you know, a, a delivery model for our customers. And, and we'd done it for about two weeks. It wasn't, it wasn't what we wanted to do. It wasn't um, the experience we wanted to give our, our guests either. It wasn't what we thought of uh, from the Ghana at the time. You know, that'll probably change over the next, you know, month, two months, um, depending, because we have a, a large team that we have to support. You know, we've got the responsibility of keeping people's livelihoods um, alive. You know, so it is is quite um, movable. The Gold Coast posts keep moving. Um, but our, our sense of community and responsibility, you know, we have access to food. We have access to producers. I've got a state-of-the-art kitchen. You know, it'd be a, you know, a sin to leave it empty, you know, to gather dust and to do nothing with that. You know, that, that was it. Well, that's that's fascinating to hear, that, and I hope we'll have the chance to pick up on on, on some of those themes again when when we in, involve the others. So let me let me turn now to to Giovanna Isebi, who's the owner of Isebi Deli and Restaurant uh, in in the, the West End of Glasgow, and uh, yeah, Gi Giovanna um, comes from um, an Italian heritage, and you know and you know the the the, the Extend you know, it's a second second generation. She, she you know she grew up in the shop, um, as it were. So um, you know there's a, there's a long a long history of her involvement, not just uh, you know in hospitality, but also that sense that sense of community uh, that's you know, very close. Uh, we're all aware of from from those traditions. So Giovanna, um, welcome, and and it would be great to to hear just how things have been for you guys uh, over the last six months, and 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 the kind of things that you you've been involved with. Thank you, Donald, and it's really really lovely um, to be on here and have a voice. Um, I think what you said at the beginning was very relevant. That you know, how do you keep the humanity in hospitality because that's what we're all about. And I think in the day we closed, you know, like Peter, you know, it's heart wrenching because. It's your whole, for us, it was generations of, of work that had gone into this. It, you know, it hadn't been handed to us. It'd been the company East End. It'd been a big dream. We got to the West End. And then that night, just watching everything being boarded down and not knowing what was going to happen next and the palpable fear, you know, with our team, you know, you've got 40 staff, you've got 40 mortgages, you've got responsibilities, like Peter said. So there's all of, there's a real story behind that. And I think from, from my brother and I, the most important thing that night was that we just kept connected to our community and to our team and to our customers. Um, and like Peter that night, we gave our excess food to Fair Share because it was a sin to throw anything out. Um, we had no idea what was ahead of us. We closed the doors. Um, and for the first time ever, you know, I'm always so busy, so busy, so busy. And I actually got a chance to keep connected to people in my industry. And one of those was Peter and Steve and many, many others. It was almost like a wee family that we worked as a network and we were all helping different charities that just like, you know, who are you going to for this? Who's giving you some food? Who's donating? Um, so a call for help came from us through one of our team to the homeless charity, Kindness. Uh, they, they had just really, they were only operating voluntary twice a week, um, feeding in the city centre. Suddenly with COVID, you know, all the big homeless units were being shut down. And, you know, people were being told to stay at home. But if you have no home, then how can you stay at home? So my mum and I started cooking some food. And it was about 80 hot meals a day. And Michael Jell and the manager would pick them up from our doorstep. And then we put out on social media because kindness asked us to. We were a bit uncomfortable with all of that as well. But then it actually really helped them. It spiralled. And before we knew it, our team, people were donating to them. But also our customers got connected. You know, a lot of them were seeing... We've got nothing to do. We're at home. You know, we can't really cook, but we can make sandwiches and we can make pots of soup. Um, so like Peter, I only experienced the best of humanity out of this whole situation. People just came together. You know, the, the, the dialogue changed completely. Um, so I think it's been a very positive experience, but I think it also showed the fragility of, of our food landscape in this country. And it made me start to think a lot more about our sustainability, you know, the easiest thing to do when you're hit with the finance of your of your business being shut down and not knowing truthfully, you know, are, are you going to have a pot to piss in tomorrow? You know, you're going to be able to pay the bills, are you going to be able to afford to put switch a light on? 
Um, the easiest thing to do is to throw away all those generations, all those values in the bin and just say, do you know what, we'll just do anything now just to make a buck. You know, we'll, 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 we did do takeaway and we, we did do delivery, but that's been very part of our business model. As you know, Donald, our shop started in the East End. It was a deli. It was real food made by real people. They'd be known as in the kitchen. People would bring in their dishes and would make up handmade pasta to take home. So we went back to that model. And we looked at our packaging because we knew we would go through mountains of it. So we found some really good pulp packaging. Um, we shrunk our menus. Uh, and we've kind of followed that on since we came back. The restaurant always had a, a seasonal menu, but now we've shrunk it. Um, and we now change it within the seasons, which we're able to do because our covers have been reduced from 80 to 30. Um, so we're able to work with a different model now. Uh, we're able to also reevaluate our food waste as well within the restaurant. So now once a week, we're closed on a Monday. So now on a Sunday evening, we take all our food um, and we make that into 100 meals um, for kindness on a Sunday evening, just to continue doing that. I really thought it was important to keep that connection with them going. And it, it just makes you rethink about everything that you're doing, you know. And I think every chance just to breathe and, and Mother Earth to breathe and to hear the birds singing, I know that all sounds a bit a bit dreamy, but it, it just makes you reevaluate the crazy pressure cooker that we were all living in for so long. So the good thing that's come out of it is, um, you know, I think we've seen how fragile our food system is. I think we've seen that when, you know, we're all down our chips, how we all come together, that there's goodness and kindness out there. Um, and, you know, coming together for the common good uh, and just, you know, putting human rights at the heart of everything that we do in our food system now, whether you operate as a cafe, a restaurant, um, whatever that is, but just just hopefully all having learned something from, from this experience. Yeah, because uh, I suppose things being the way the way the, the, it has panned out, you know, there's a temptation to say, okay, um, when closed sh shutdown came and, you know, you had to pivot, you had to you know, go and do something and, and actually great, you know, fantastic. You found these, these opportunities to you know, engage with, with charities uh, and, and cook for them and so on. But then now we're, we come through August, you've reopened, there's, there's, there's inevitably a focus on saying, oh, well, how do I, you know, I've got to get this business working again. I've got to put my, my focus and energies um, on this. Is there, is there still space in that for you to, 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 to um, retain those connections with, uh, you know, the charities and, the, and, and the, the extra work? And it's interesting to hear your example of your Sunday evening cook with the, um, the waste that's that's great to hear but you know I suppose there must be that sense of you don't you don't want just to drop them all the minute you've then suddenly got to refocus on the business you know are there are there ways in which it can be incorporated into into just not the business model so much as you've said it, it's the whole everything's got to be included into, into that model it's not just a business model because it's also a community model it's also a life a life model and just you know it has that have you felt have you have you felt the the, the urge that that really has to, has to be integrated now, whatever however it goes forward? Yeah, I mean I mean I think the small things are the big things. So, you know, we've come through all this together, um, as a community, as an industry, and you, you can't. We're not the same people. Nothing's the same, you know. And and this is a new journey that we're all on now. Everything's changed. There's more to come. You know, there's, there's more hardship to come as well. This has actually made things even worse for people. The right to have a decent meal is actually just going to get worse. It's not going to get any better. So collectively, we still have to keep working at it. You know, so if we all just do one small thing, I know we're all trying to save our businesses and we're all back on the treadmill again. I, I am a victim of that too. I'm trying to keep, like Peter, you know, keeping your business running. You're, you'll never make up for what you've lost. But we've lived through this. We've come through it so far. And we have to reevaluate and rethink how we do things. If there ever was a time to do that, it's now. If you haven't learned anything from it, then, you know, what was the point? So, you know, and, and I think, you know, if all of that can be channeled into the common good, which I think it is, you know, everyone that's around this, 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 this forum tonight is sitting there. They all have a good heart, you know, their heart's in the right place. Um, and, you know, and I think 
you know, the examples that are set, you know, or just maybe inspire other people as well? No, I, I agree. And I think that's one of the, the really important things about this uh, forum, as, as you say tonight, and being able to tell the stories and, and know that people are interested to hear what's been happening in different parts of the country. And, and it, there's a richness there, isn't there? You know, when you start to, to be able to, to, to hear the, what the stories that people are able to tell um, and you realise just actually how connected people are and, and, and how they how that desire to help, you know, this is not just about people wanting to get their name in lights. It's, you know, it's not, you know, this, this, these, the ego trip, um, you know, the, you know, getting the, the bigger flasher car because business is going well, you know, suddenly this opens up, um, you know, a, a real, a better understanding just of, of, of how chefs and cooks and restaurants and, you know, have, have these, these, these wider reaches. Great. So thanks, Giovanna. That's fascinating and, 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 and inspiring uh, indeed to, you know, to hear what you've been doing. Um, and now I'd like to turn to uh, our third uh, member of the Cooks Alliance. And indeed, um, Steve is, is the leader of, of the Cooks Alliance uh, in Scotland. Steve, Steve Brown is uh, head of food at Edinburgh Food Social, which is a, a social enterprise, um, obviously based in Edinburgh and uh, works in various ways. I'm sure uh, Steve, will, um, Steve will explain, but you know, uh, there's a lot involved in, in education and, and training and learning uh, in, 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 in the work that, that he does. So Steve, um, welcome tonight, great to see you. And please uh, share, let us know what, what, what you've been up to, uh, not as a restaurant owner, um, you know, not, not in that direct line of, line of fire as, as as Peter and Giovanna were but 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 a fascinating perspective and actually a great perspective in that you you were you were well connected to, to many different chefs um you know across Scotland and, and were able to sort of help coordinate some of the work that they were doing so we, we'd love to hear a bit more about that yeah yeah well thank you very much for having me it's amazing to see all you guys in one uh, in one collected place, even though it's over a screen. Um, so yeah, amazing to see you, and thank you to everybody who's who's listening as well. So yeah, Peter, Peter and Giovanna both mentioned having spoken to, to me, and and particularly remember the conversation that I had with Peter because it was one of the earliest conversations that I had, um, and I'm pretty sure it was on a Sunday afternoon, um, and I just remember this dawning realization that a lot of people were about to be hungry and a lot of chefs were about to have less people to cook for um, and ultimately it was it was an opportunity to put those two things together um, and uh, and I sent out like a kind of text message um, a whatsapp message to like 130 people that I knew um, and then ultimately you know over the period of you know, a day or so, there were some people who kind of came to the to the fore, I guess, to, to you know, who, who seemed that they were able to help. So we created a what we called a, an informal coalition of organizations that included Slow Food and Nourish, and another organization called Nourishing Change, who had worked in the jungles in Cali. Um, also, um, who else was involved? Goodness gracious. There was, um, there was Edinburgh Food Festival. So there were a few different organizations and we kind of felt that as a collective, we could, you know, we could do something together um, yeah, with that kind of collective power. So we too kind of crowdfunded some money um, to kind of get us started. We had an awful lot of frantic conversations with people in the early days. Some people we never spoke to again. Some people we became very, very good friends and uh, and we sourced kitchens. We thought that we would continue to buy food rather than, we did repurpose food and we did use, you know, food, food, yeah, food that would have otherwise not been used, but we didn't use fair share. We kept money in the kind of system essentially by using suppliers. Um, whether that was direct or, or or through a kind of wholesaler and um and yeah we we essentially created like a a, 
three pillars that we revolved everything, all of our decisions around, which were community, um, sustainability, and dignity. And um, so all of our decisions were made around about those three pillars. And within a little while, we were the first to kind of start cooking in Edinburgh. And um, we had sourced our kitchens, we had our chefs, we had our volunteers, we had some people that we were able to support financially who would have not had finances otherwise. <coughs> Excuse me, that's not persistent. Um, then we created a tiered system um, that delivered food in multiple ways. Um, so we had tier one, which were our kind of core partners. Um, we had tier two, which were our community partners. So we didn't feel that we wanted to support as many people as possible, but we didn't feel that we had the resources or the ability to actually identify need within the communities. So we kind of outsourced that as it were, or well, outsourced is the wrong word, but we worked with community partners who knew who needed food within their own communities. Um, tier three was um, a, a direct pe people who had come to us directly, so we gave them like an emergency provision. And um, so they perhaps um, approached us uh, through social media or um, through email or they called or whatever way it was that was direct, a direct approach, and we helped them immediately. Um, and then tier four was some of those tier three individuals. Um, it became clear that some of them just needed support for like a, a couple of days until they were signposted, which was something else that we did. We signposted people to, to places where they could get help. Um, but then it also became clear that some people needed a more regular provision. And um, so they became our tier four uh, kind of service users. So we provided food to them three times a week or three deliveries a week for seven days a week's worth of food. Um, and uh, and yeah, we you know it was it was pretty kind of frantic in the early days, and then it became just quite a big undertaking. But then, of course, I didn't have a business to worry about. You know, we in in fact in in a strange way, I've actually come from a, an environment where my business model was really fragile. <laughs> You know, I was relying on funding. I didn't know, you know, like every month when my wages came out, you know, I felt I felt weirdly responsible to the young people that I taught because, you know, I didn't want to be paid for what I did, but I, I you know, it had to be the case. And 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 COVID, you know, has kind of changed that, you know, in that we we're not reliant on business, so therefore we're, we're not as impacted and and actually funding was something that took a little while to come through initially from the government and from elsewhere but actually when it started coming through it was done in a much more relaxed way like uh, if anybody knows about funding and funding applications the hoops that you have to jump through to get funding is a, an absolute nightmare whereas actually you know we had some proactive grants so like at one point i was given an email saying you know you have been given two thousand pounds you know, because we know of the work that you're doing, just let us know how you're going to spend it, and then that'll be fine. You know, so 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 a lot of the restrictions were eased, and and, and money came a little bit um, more freely, and obviously we were able to direct that very very quickly into the food provision that we offered people. Um, in terms of community, I guess you know we covered that slightly. You know how we worked with our communities across Edinburgh to make sure that the right people had had food. Well, sorry. The right people is not the the people that that needed food most were, were 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 given you know were given that food but then equally there was a food provision for as many people as wanted it no questions asked you know absolutely if you needed food you got it full stop um the sustainability piece um meant that we spoke to people like peel and farm uh, for example, you know, many, many of you will know Peelham Farm from, from, from Slow Food, um, a great farm in Berwickshire. And of course, when they change the, uh, the kind of gauge on their mincer or they've got some offcuts, then they would give us all that kind of sausage meat and all that mince, you know, we would turn that into, uh, you know, casseroles and so on and so forth, you know. So the fact, you know, it was, me it was suggested to us in the early days, oh, you know, just give people you know, give these people, you know, some mac and cheese, you know, and, and, and people are saying to us, oh, we don't want any of that green stuff. 
uh, in our food. And, you know, that that was a tricky one for us, you know, because, yes, there's a responsibility to give people food that they like. But then I I think that we gave people a lot of food that they wouldn't have been able to afford prior you know a lot more uh, fresh fruit and vegetables you know a lot like different dishes now we were never encouraging people to you know the, the dignity aspect was giving people a choice so we were never forcing food on anybody that didn't want it you know in the in the knowledge that that was the food delivery that they were getting but then you know we were strengthened in our resolve by people getting in touch with us saying I would never have had that before and it was absolutely delicious and can I please have it again and you know can we you know so 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 this was fantastic you know so we were able we were doing things you know we were doing you know we were doing shepherd's pie and we were doing stovies and things but we're also doing like you know celeriac and smoked haddock you know kind of gratins and things you know so we were doing all sorts of different dishes um, and the feedback was fantastic, you know, so so it was great to be able to work with Denise, to be able to work with like local, um, you know, fishmongers. We worked with a, a veg supplier uh, in Glasgow and um, and yeah, over the course of the time that we provided food, I think it ended up being about 65,000 uh, portions of food all in all. Steve, that's, I mean, it's a, a remarkable uh achievement and, and, and a remarkable um, energizing of, uh, you know, gathering of, en of, of all that energy and enthusiasm. But I suppose one question is interesting that I've picked up from, from all three of you, actually, is this sense of, you know, you, 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 you felt there was a chance to, to cook for people. So, so a lot of the time when we talk about people who are, who are, who are needing food, who, you know, who are, who are maybe it, um, food insecure or are facing some element of food poverty uh, you know the the food banks are, are are cited you know just somewhere where you can and, and go and uh, that that is an answer an answer to the problem and yet this is a this this threw up a different model and as you as you say you know you you got you were organizing supply chains so that you could be cooking fresh food and, and making it available very quickly, and it, it and it was clearly, you know, a lot of the time the the, the raw ingredients were were fresh, they were they were good quality, they were they were being cooked by expert chefs, um, and and you know in a it, it, you know at a relatively small scale, you know, this was not factory, this wasn't just factory cooking. So, so do you think actually this this period has moved on that discussion about about how to nourish and how to support people that are, that are hungry in, in, at different levels or, or looking for food or, or, or feeling that level of, of insecurity did you there was a, a new connection you were able to make beyond the, the traditional food banks yeah so without you know if you want to respond yeah i mean for, you know for for me without uh, without that, you know, this is not a comment on the incredible people who volunteer and the people at the Trussell Trust who, who do great stuff. But, you know, I, I do genuinely believe that food banks should be eradicated. Um, and I think that the only time a politician should go to a food bank is to shut it down. Um, you know, um, and, and, and I think that, you know, pe people should have, you know, we spoke about dignity. You know, not only should people have a right to food, a right to good, nourishing food, but, but also um, people should have uh, the dignity to choose the food that they would like. You know, now I have to say the Scottish government pumped a lot of money into food banks, you know, during this time, a lot, they were given a lot of money to purchase fresh food and so on and so forth. But prior to that, you know, it was, it was essentially kind of supermarket, ha you know, handouts, you know, and, and then of course, the reason that the, the food banks were dry quite quickly was that the supermarkets weren't quality controlling anything that was going through. They just put everything on the shelves. So, you know, and, and people weren't, you know, passing anything into the, the baskets, you know, but I don't think that the, the people who need a hand in our communities should be reliant on, 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 on surplus or, or handouts from, from supermarkets, you know? I think that there should be community-led, um, you know, food hubs, um, community pantries um, that are providing real nutritious, fresh uh, ingredients for people to go and uh, choose from, 
Um, and, and I think that the, the fact that they pay for that service is imperative, you know, even if it is a small amount, a token amount almost, to, to, to give people uh, that dignity around about the choices that they have. You know, we, um, we're very, very fortunate, you know, to, to, to have what we have here, you know, and, 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 and I think that, you know, the choices that we have um, sh should very much be the choices that everybody else has in the community, no matter their standing, race, creed, colour, anything else. Yeah, so it's it, you. You you've you've um, introduced politics in a way, and 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 suggested you know uh, that uh, politicians and and those you know should not necessarily be looking at food banks as a as a, as, as any sort of magic wand to the, to addressing these problems. Do you do you see something like a piece of legislation that's that actually puts into uh, enacts in law? a right to food as being anything other than paying lip service or, or, or is it actually striking at, at something fundamental here? Um, and, uh, you know, will, can, can you foresee that having structural, structural changes in Scotland? I mean, obviously the way that the bill, you know, if, if the bill is passed, then the way that it's delivered is key to its success. But I would be disappointed if we got to the point that it, it was enshrined in Scots law and then wasn't delivered in in the way. I mean, I think in the way that it should be. I mean, I think what we've seen here is during the conversations that I was having with people in the early days, it was as if we were caretaking with a food provision. And I was waiting for like an adult to come along uh, and and take it over. Um, you know, and say, oh, we're here now, so you don't have to do this anymore. Um, and then, you, you know, I remember vividly on a phone call, somebody just saying, no, nobody's, you know, nobody's coming. <laughs> you know, now I am glad that the third sector or, or you know, I mean, I, well, many, many people were, were, were you know, Giovanna and, and, and Peter, amongst many, many other incredible chefs, stood, you know, stepped up. But then from my sector, you know, I'm glad that the third sector was able to to feed people you know and i'm proud of that fact you know but they must be supported to do that you know now you know so so that's the big thing for me and i know that that's not necessarily to do with the bill but you know if we are given a right to food then let's not have the government decide how that is happening but let's have the government consulting communities and speaking to real people and asking them the types of solutions that they would like to see that fit into their lives. This is maybe a question I'll put back to the others too as well to say, I know it's very hard to look into the future and, and from a business point of view, it may be a case of just, you know, we're, you're operating day to day and you, you almost kind of dread the next appearance um, from the first minister or the prime minister to, to you know, announce some, some further restriction, um, um, further um, uh, restrict the number of people that might be coming uh, in, into the business. But what do you see looking into the future and, you know, it, it just in terms of, of things that will probably never be the same again, things that have been fundamentally changed just in the way that, that you, you see generally people looking at food or maybe your own, your own vision, your own understanding of, of, of food, your relationship to it and relationship to food and relationship to, to the communities around you. Yeah, I'm just wondering, you know, just any, any sort of more, prof I suppose, more profound thoughts about the future, you know, what, what, what has changed that uh, for you? I mean, or this may just be on a smaller scale, you know, uh, do you see, do you see the way that you, you, you run the restaurant will just never, never be the same again, or, or, or you know, just things that have, have changed that will, will won't go, you, things you won't be going back to, I suppose. Yeah, well, it, it has changed. It's completely changed. Um, the way that we operate has changed. You know, we went from a six day a week to a five day a week. You know, one of the, the, the beautiful things about the lockdown process and period we got to spend lots of time with our family. As Giovanna said, I've got a small daughter, a wife, you know, five days of the week, I don't really see them. And, you know, we, we all slid back into that trap again, you know, but going forward, once we're, you know, we're through this, we're through this winter. And um, because, I, you know, I think the next six months, 
you know, we, we, we are all trying to hold on to the business that we, we built up Giovanna for a long, long time for us is seven years, which is also is quite a substantial amount of time and trying to keep everybody, you know, stable and trying to keep all our staff there, trying not to make redundancies. Um, and the way that we, we look at food um, we're doing things on a smaller scale again. Like we, we, we've always, the reason I got involved with Slow Food and the, the Chef's Alliance, because I, I like to touch base with the guys that I, I buy my products from. You know, I like to go out to the farms. I like to, you know, ring them up. The person that's rearing the, the pigs, uh, Peelham Farm, I'm really good friends with those guys and our Dunan Farm, you know, a collection of them. But it's able to, you know, we're only doing maximum 40 covers a night. So it's about reinforcing that um, food network, you know, making sure that the food I get is from that place, from that place, and making sure that all our guests know that, supporting that um, farm to fork model, you know, and even with a bigger emphasis. Um, I, I think they're, they're the people that stood up and, and were behind us, you know, um, they, they all, you know, give us stock, you know, St. Brides came with the boxes of chickens, you know, David and Gillian give us two whole rare breed, breed pigs, you know, it's, it's about keeping those um, relationships alive, you know, I don't have a crystal ball, I don't know where we'll be by Christmas, you know, I, I have no idea, I'm hoping for the best, you know, I'm working very hard, our team are all working very hard, we've been very careful. Um, we've got a smaller team. A lot of our team went um, back to the, the countries they were raised in. Um, so we, we, we didn't fill the slots. We, we kept it small. We kept it tight. Um, and, and it's about looking after each other, you know, looking after everybody in the team. Um, Giovanna, I'm sure you've got. Sorry, Peter, I think you said a lot of what you said is... It, it, very much how I feel as well and what we are going through too. We're going down similar paths at the moment. Um, I, I don't know what the future holds. Uh, I'm just taking everything I do at the time. There's obviously anxiety at the moment, uh, not knowing what is going to be done. But I'd like to think that I, when we come out of all of this, that there'll be a better world and there'll be opportunities. People will think more. I think the lockdown gave people a chance. All we could see on social media was making sourdough bread. I've seen another person making sourdough bread. <laughs> but what it taught people, again, by, by slowing things down, they realised the amount of work that goes into making all of this. It's a three-day process. It's, you know, you've got to buy good ingredients. Suddenly flour was a difficult thing to get. Flour is life. It's such a really simple thing. So maybe it simplified everybody's view to food again, like the fastness of it, like how consuming it is, you know, eating out in a restaurant is something you do three times a day, every day of the week, throwing food away. So maybe, you know, it's becoming more of a special occasion. And a bit like you, Peter, we have, you know, shrunk our menu. We, we really are have time to educate and evaluate again with, with our customers, which is a really nice thing. So not just connecting with the supplier, but actually we are the final story of the plate to, you know, when it gets to that table. So we've got a chance to connect and tell them more um, and share those stories. So perhaps, you know, it's just putting a bit of heart behind food again, making people s just see it differently from, from a different perspective. We were all running so, so fast. That we actually forgot to savour, taste and enjoy the moment. So maybe now people will just start to enjoy the moment. Well, that, that's a lovely, um, it's a lovely way to conclude things, Giovanna. And, 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 and I think, you're absolutely right that if, if, if anything else, uh, food has food has emerged a little bit from the, uh, it, it's often invisible in our world and, and, and often all that goes into food, all that's behind food can can feel invisible. I said right at the beginning that, you know, we used to, there's a lot, many things that we took for granted that, that COVID uh, suddenly brought up short and we couldn't take them for granted. And food, food, is, food has come up again and again through 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 the whole lockdown as, as being a topic that people now want to talk about. And when there's conversations, there's just the chance to open things up and to listen to other people, hear what hear hear their experiences, understand 
a little bit more of that whole diversity, uh, diverse world that we live in, uh, and it's fascinating. And, and food, as it always has been, as, as a, a not just a topic of conversation, but a venue for conversation, you know, whether, whether it's in a restaurant or around the family table, uh, indeed, sometimes over Zoom, uh, and uh, people, uh, sh you know, try to share food and, 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 and keep up with their friends uh, and, and, and contacts that way. So, you know, food, food has emerged a little bit. Um, and, and if it does give us pause to think, just is that, is that distribution fair? Is that, is, that, is that sense of connection to food as fairly distributed as it, as it could be? Are there ways in which we can improve that? And I think we've touched we've touched on some of those issues and and and, and that realization, and started to see it's it's not clear we've got a long way to go, but we started to see glimpses of, of how that could be done better in the future and, and how those those connections could be improved. Guys, uh, thank you so much for spending this last hour uh, with us. Thanks for for telling us your stories, uh, for inspiring us, for. And giving us more things to reflect on for, for, for shining a bit of a light on, on, on some of the different things that have been happening in the last six months. It's been, it's been really, really interesting and really, really valuable. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Walter, uh, who's also been uh, in on this uh, call and, and sort of turning the knobs and uh, doing the, the technical uh, background and has been there to support us. So thanks very much, uh, for, for Walter, for that. Uh, Finally, just to say this, uh, this session is just one of a range of different topics that have been covered in the, the course of the weekend uh, with uh, Slow Food UK's Terra Madra Fringe. There's, there's a whole range of fantastic events. Please look at the programme, uh, find other things to get involved with. There's some live sessions, there's some recorded sessions, there's some tastings. They come from all four corners of the United Kingdom. Um, and there's, there's just lots and lots to, to, to uh, get into. If you have the opportunity, we um, would welcome some, uh, some feedback. Um, there's a chance if you go onto the Terra Magia Fringe website, uh, there's a chance please to donate just a small amount of money. So many people in so many different ways have given small little donations in different places and, and I'm sure you've all done that. This is just another example uh, of, of a way in which you can just help this sort of thing happen where we can we can share ideas, we can share stories, we can share inspiration, because actually in the end of the day, inspiration and ideas can be priceless in the right place at the right time. Um, and it's been nice to, uh, to, to talk to you guys um, and, 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 and to realize how much there is going on out there and, and how, may, how much uh, that you, are, you have been in, engaged in this whole process and, and wanting to make things better. So thanks again. Uh, thanks to all of you who have watched and been part of this. And uh, please uh, go well, eat well, um, and love food. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Sorry, I'll the old closing remarks.